This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Microsoft Azure. Do you have an idea for a blockchain app but are worried about the time and cost it will take to develop? The new Azure Blockchain Dev Kit is a free download that brings together the tools you need to get your first app running in less than 30 minutes. Learn more at aka.ms slash epicenter. Hi, my name is Brian Fabian Crane. And my name is Friederike Ernst. So before we start with the interview, you guys did a wonderful conference last year called ZapCon and another one is coming up again this year. Like, tell us a little bit about the ZapCon conference. Yeah, so it's, um, we, we had one last year. It was our first, it was Nosus's first conference. We're organizing another one uh, this year uh, by popular demand. It'll be August 21 to 23rd. It'll, it'll concentrate on um, dApps, dApps that are usable um, on Ethereum. Um, and uh, tickets are pretty affordable. So uh, full price tickets is uh, 150 euros and there are hacker tickets and student tickets. Um, and uh, we are looking forward to having uh, many hundred people there. Um, if you want to check it out, it's um, at debcon.io. Perfect. And of course, we'll, we can put a, a link to that in the episode notes too. Well, one thing that we should also say is that uh, the, a couple of the Epicenter hosts are going to moderate panels uh, as well. Okay, that, well, that, that makes the conference all, all that much better. So today we spoke with Aya Miyaguchi. She's the executive director of the Ethereum Foundation. And of course, Ethereum Foundation being, you know, one of the most, uh, one of the largest, you know, kind of this original Swiss crypto foundation uh, and, you know, having had a, you know, a tremendous impact on the space through their, you know, funding of Ethereum and developing of Ethereum and kind of, you know, steering Ethereum through all its, its history. Yeah. What did you think of the interview, Federica? I heard many positive things. So I, I like that uh, the Ethereum Foundation is moving into a direction of transparency, uh, which so far has often been somewhat lacking. I remain curious to see how uh, this plays out. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's, it's, it's a little bit, it was not so easy to get answers, I think, for a lot of questions. But, you know, I think uh, they're making an attempt and, and that uh, that's, uh, should be uh, honored and appreciated. So let's go to the interview with Aya. Hi and welcome. So we're here today with Aya Miyaguchi. She's the uh, executive director of the Ethereum Foundation. Of course, the Ethereum Foundation having had a, you know an enormous impact on the blockchain space since the beginning when it conducted kind of the first or one of the first uh, token sales or of public fundraisers for a crypto project, and then has as you know has done a tremendous amount in terms of building the Ethereum ecosystem. So really excited to have. Uh, I on today to speak a little bit about the you know the role of the foundation and how that has changed and evolved over time. So thanks so much for joining us, Aya. Excited to be here. So so I'm curious to get started. Like, how did you originally become involved in the crypto space? Like, you saw you were a high school teacher for ten years. That seems quite a quite a change and transition. Yes. Uh, so I I. I am originally from Japan. I was born and grew up there. And like you said, I, my first career, professional career, was a high school teacher. And I was teaching English to high school students there for a long time, actually, for over 10 years. And then as a teacher, my basically, I had some experience studying abroad. And then Japan is, Japan is a big economy, but at the same time, it's pretty isolated it's, it's surrounded by the ocean and then the culture is not that diverse um, so I my mission was to tell my students like you know to at least go out there and then see the world and then you know feel the diversity so I was I was telling him like my I was inspiring students to do that and my students, Started to go abroad, and then, and in the meantime, like I also had this question about like how teachers didn't really try to go outside themselves, and then I thought it was important for education for the teachers to also have more diverse experience. And I also got jealous of my students who were <laughs> going out there, and there wasn't a lot of opportunity 
for for teachers to kind of take a leave or paid leave to go outside and learn. Um, so I th- I just decided to quit. Um, I still I'm I'm still passionate about education. So if I I thought if I if I want to go back, I can just always come back. So I left the country and then moved to the U.S. And originally, that I wanted to well, in order for me to get a job, I or in order for me to get a job, I needed a visa. And in order for me to get a visa, a working visa, I uh, it was better for me to get some uh, like master's degree. And um, since I thought I learned enough about education, being a teacher, I decided to get a business degree. Uh, and then, so when I was working on my MBA, my focus was sustainable business, which, you know, like you kind of have to think about economic and environmental, social sustainabilities for, for business to even make, make profit. And I thought that was interesting. And, and also had some experience working for a nonprofit, uh, when I was uh, like working on MBA. And also specifically, uh, I was focused on microfinance, fi- financial inclusion for that sustainable business study. And, and that's when I learned about, I heard about Bitcoin. When was this, Aya? Which year? So this was in 2011. And that was the time that I heard about Bitcoin. And then originally, there was no... Uh, materials to learn so it, like now like bitcoin seems very simple now for us but since there was no information education it took me a while to understand what it was and then but then uh when i learned what it was and i thought oh this is really like would be perfect opportunity or a combination with with things like microfinance and just it was just a, to um, a thinking about the efficiency that can create. Uh, but then now, like of course, with Ethereum, you can do a lot more. But back then, I thought that was my interest, and and then I, well, this is going to create a lot of impact in financial inclusions. And then I just had a chance to, uh, since I was in San Francisco, a company who started um, Kraken. Well, it was I joined Kraken when the team was um, getting non-dev people. So I was original, like a few funding members, uh, one of a few funding members. And I, I had an opportunity to join Kraken before their launch, before its launch. And um, that was early 2013. It was around the time that all other crypto efforts or startups started. Uh, other groups like Coinbase or like all started to happen. And then San Francisco was kind of center of those companies. And then a Ripple was there. And I still remember that my first blockchain event was Bitcoin event in San Jose 2013. In April, it felt big that the event seemed big back then, but now looking back, it was very small. Uh, mm-hmm. We had everyone like who are now the leaders of this, this industry, but it was very, very still very geeky, nerdy group. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's funny. Like I thought, wow, this is almost too, too geeky for me. <laughs> I came to the wrong place, but. Cool. And so, so you worked at Kraken for a few years. Then how did you, uh, how did you end up uh, at the Ethereum Foundation? Um, so I worked at Kraken a few years. My job involved a lot of different things, including like basically I was heavily involved in starting like, you know, like uh, up the ecosystem in Japan, the crypto. There was no crypto industry there when I joined. But because of what happened to Mangox, which was a big thing, the Mangox hacked also their how they collapsed. Um, I was 
he had been involved in the regulatory situations in Japan too. And I had come was always having a conversation with the government and the bankruptcy case and also building starting off the industry association there. Uh, and I was doing all that and and then and I, so clock and work was really still during the, t- the early stage of crypto industry. My passion, again, original my passion was into this impact um, side of blockchain. So I I decided to leave and focused on more on this like you know social impact side of blockchain. And um, and then when I my actually was was kind of working on different things and uh, personally advising different. Um, applications and around that time yeah I was asked to have interviews with the Ethereum Foundation people when they were uh, looking to looking for help for the Ethereum Foundation and I spoke with them and I joined the foundation that was uh, early last year so um, there's some sort of, um, so the foundation is a fairly centralized organ that governs or that um, kind of steers a space that is very decentralized. Um, so how would you describe the role of the Ethereum Foundation in Ethereum today? Yeah, I wouldn't describe this organization as centralized at all, um, I guess, at all, because when I joined, um, it was since, like, I think I flew to Berlin to meet some um, developers there. And I was told there are, you know, a bunch of other people who are all spread out to um, the, the d- different places in the world. Um, but it is still compared to, like, even flat startup. This is very decentralized because almost like not almost like all project in in ethereum including the stuff that the members of ethereum foundations are involved in are not only by the foundations members that they, they, they're collaborations with other community members so it is really hard to draw the line who is working on one project so i i couldn't tell like who are the members of one project and that alone like shows how decentralized the whole thing is. So it's really hard to, it's more like the coordination is very important and the foundation's role is to coordinate everything in the ecosystem and so that the the goal is to really support the team and, and that's it. And meaning it can be about education, it can be about development research, but uh, how it works is not us to it not the Ethereum Foundation to do education like for like we can support that effort but fundamentally we are the coordinators we are we like our peoples are coordinating like especially our operations team is coordinating so the foundation's role is to support everything in Ethereum we have operations team we have grant program team. And, and then we do have some developers and researchers who uh, who work on projects, but their projects also are not centralized by the, the Ethereum Foundation's member. They work with uh, people in the ecosystem to actually work on the project. So it's really hard to say who is working on one project because of that, that structure. Sounds- that sounds very difficult in terms of governance. Can you talk a little bit about the governance structure of the of the foundation? So, um, how how does the Ethereum Foundation actually take decisions, and um, who has what role in that? Yeah, so the governance is definitely difficult. Like, uh, like now, like people want to somehow the governance has become like a super hot topic, but. It is governance exists in any organization, any any structure. Um, but again, like I'm like the coordinator of coordinators, meaning like we try to let 
each team or each uh, members to make their own decisions. And and we, we, our job is to support their decision and they coordinate their decision with other decisions. So that's why I see my job as a, the coordinator of coordinators, but I can't really coordinate everything by myself. So I have other people to coordinate together. And it's more like I oversee all these coordination works. Um, so decision making is never top down. We don't really, uh, I don't know if you know, like a lot of people, I have this title, but this title doesn't really explain my my work because that's this this is something that doesn't really exist in other organizations. But so just just to get like a little bit more specific, so you mentioned kind of coordinating and different parts, but like are there some kind of you know principles or like core processes that you use to say like okay, this is this is the way the Ethereum Foundation goes about it so that, you know, we get good outcomes and maybe the different interests are protected. Like, yeah, what so the... again, there is like a team guess and then we let them make decisions over their, their roadmap and then uh, they suggest a uh, budget. This is, this is a plan that we want to, uh, this is a roadmap we want to execute this year and this is how much we would need. Uh, and then since that's one project we need to support, and we have to think about the total budget. Uh, so that's why the coordination happens there. They can make their own decision on for their own team, but uh, like they can't really see, decide on other projects. So we coordinate that effort. So that's why when I use that term coordination, yes, we have to have some structure for, for this coordination to work. And the structure meaning like they suggest and it's that, so it's not in the normal company, the management decide on everything. Here's a plan, like you guys have to work on this way, but it's not that way. Like they, they suggest their ideas and then we coordinate the, the, their decisions. But um, given that there's probably not unlimited funding of all, um, this means that someone actually have, has to restrict teams and say, this is too much, you can't, you can't have that much. And, um, decide on the general direction that the foundation is going to go in is is that you or who is that we have we have like a other operations team that's basically listen to like together together with me listen to their request and then but again so i don't want to get too deep into like internal teams or so that the plan that we are about to make it more like make it clear is that uh, this this concept of external teams that we're funding with grant and then internal teams that we want to eliminate this distinction between internal and external. At the end of the day, the foundation's goal is to support important project in the ecosystem. Well, I mean, important meaning like our focus would be, uh, like you said, when we have limited budget, how we make decisions is really like what what are most important in the ecosystem now. So it shouldn't be about internal or external. And so we are looking at the, the number that I just uh, mentioned at Ethereum. We're going to spend about 30 million um, to support Ethereum this year. Is that that rough decision is decided by a few like uh, our operations team, including myself, and but then that the, how we spend those monies are depending on the types of decisions. We have multiple people to make the decisions. Again, like I, uh, I need other people. That's not really only unique about our organization. Like I don't, yeah, maybe there are, there are small companies who like only CEO make decisions, but that we, we have experts in so, finance and legal and yeah. like we have to discuss different things. That's, I think that's normal for an organization. This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Microsoft and the Azure Blockchain Workbench. Getting your blockchain from the whiteboard to production can be a big undertaking. And something as simple as connecting your blockchain to IoT devices or existing ERP systems is a project in itself. Well, the folks at Microsoft have you covered. 
You already know about the Azure Blockchain Workbench and how easy it makes bootstrapping your blockchain network pre-configured with all the cloud services you need for your enterprise app. Their new development kit is the IFTTT for blockchains. Suppose you want to collect data from someone in a remote location via SMS and have that data packaged in a transaction for your Hyperledger Fabric blockchain. The development kit allows you to build this integration in just a few steps in a simple drag and drop interface. Here's another great example. Perhaps you're an institution working with Ethereum and rely on CSV files sent by email. One click in the dev kit and you can parse these files and have the data embedded in transactions. Whatever you're working with, the dev kit can read, transform, and act on the data. To learn more and to build your first application in less than 30 minutes, visit aka.ms slash epicenter. And be sure to follow them on Twitter at MSFT Blockchain. We'd like to thank Microsoft and Azure for their support of Epicenter. So of course there Ethereum has, uh, you know, sort of it, its founder, Vitalik Buterin, you know, who has a very, very high profile and, and kind of, you know, of course, extremely well known in the Ethereum community. So what's, what's Vitalik's role in the foundation? And yeah, like what, what's his role, his responsibilities and like how much power does he have? How much power? So his role is to, um, um, what is it? So I think it's he, he, he claims himself a, a chief science officer or, and uh, he's, a, he, he's a researcher and of course he's involved in um, like important research, research teams decisions. But um, when then he is involved in um, some, like I'm in charge of like, the foundation's operations, meaning like, like things like budget. And, and he's aware of like how we, you know, decide on things and then also including budget. And then, you know, like at the community, like whoever wants to listen to him, they will listen to him, but he, he doesn't really control any decision making. In effect, someone actually has not only to control the budget, but also the strategic direction of, of the foundation, right? Um, so you said that uh, you, you have experts that you listen to, um, but it sounded like the, the, the team that finally calls the shots is the operation team. So uh, is, is that correct? And um, if, if so, um, what kind of ex experts do you consult and are, are these known figure? Uh, so basically, are these known within the ecosystem as advisors to the foundation? Um, and uh, so w w what's, what's the process? Just for us to understand. Yeah, so we tried to um, actually, when I joined that operation, there was no almost like a, there was very, very, like the, the operation team wasn't big. And then also the foundation wasn't really giving up grants, uh, as you know. And, and then when we started giving a, a lot of grants, starting last year, we built this this team or grant program team and since this is still new like the team was very still like originally it was small but now we have more people including community members uh someone like evan Baness is is also providing information like what he thinks they're most important because as you know like he knows you know he he's watching he has to write we can need to him, so he, he is watching everything in the ecosystem. Uh, so we have those people who are who actually join the, the screening process of grant program. Uh, and, and I also talked about this at the ETL, our the whole grant process from the screening uh, and doing interview and making the final decisions that this involves all those other other people. And then some depending on the topic we go to, like when it, it involves security discussion, um, the grant team talks to our security team, but also sometimes like our security teams outside, they have to reach different groups depending on the topic or depending on the project that they are considering. So I, we see the entire ecosystem as Basically, we can reach anyone. Like if we if we want to, you know, take a look at prediction market discussion, and then we go to like we we go to Nosis team, and then maybe ask their 
feedback or that's like that's totally possible unless you don't want to give any feedback right okay so that's yeah that's how so you mentioned that the ethereum foundation is going to give out 30 million dollars in grants what are the you know, like what are the priorities the funding priorities like how much are you planning like are you dividing it into different categories and allocating some amount to different categories or how are you going to go about deploying that money yeah so um again this is going to be a detail is going to be provided very soon um but there are a different way to categorize this uh, one is Oh, like I think that the fundamental criteria that we use, the grant program uh, use is that like how, so when you take a look at one project and the solution it is providing, um, how how criti- critical, of course, how important is the, is, is the solution is and how urgent that solution needs to happen how unique the solution is compared to other ways of so solving pro- the problem. So that, that that kind of key criteria we do have when the grant program um, screen projects, but also, um, and then there were topics that we originally kind of, you know, like asked, uh, meaning the wish list, um, like a security, scaling, UX and and all that, but but now um, the the big categories that we have regarding the support from the Ethereum Foundation is is one for you know like what's happening on the Ethereum now and also the future of Ethereum and then it was um, something like bringing uh, more more uh, developers to to Ethereum or like that the different different types of thing that we like the, the ecosystem to have more. And then the mostly when we make decisions, we try to focus on the things on that if we don't give support, no one else would give support, but this is very important. So something that some like sometimes there are things that only the Ethereum Foundation can do because of our unique position with the history. Can you give an example for that, Aya? Yeah, like something like a research projects that like do like a lot of a lot of project project we support are research project, right? And then most of them don't have business uh, model, meaning the investors wouldn't be interested in supporting them unless in investors could be interested in uh, supporting them if they can see like long term effect, including the price of this and but normally it's hard for them to receive support because they don't have business model. Okay, that makes sense. Um, so you, you just said that um, you're going to give out 30 billion um, in grants for this year. Um, as far as I know, in the foundation million, doesn't release yeah, financial the, statements. Yeah. Um, so can you give us a sense of um, what, what percentage? So how much how much uh, money does the foundation have? So basically, if you continue giving out, giving out grants for th- for thirty million a year, how long will it last you? Uh, I guess is what I'm asking. Well, that's that's uh, that depends on, of course, price of ETH, right? And then how much? So how much ether ETH we ether we have is is sort of public information because you can just go and get the information online uh so it's already out there they like information about like about the six uh six fifty k ether that ef has and and also we do have some fiat amount and then then combining that it's like how how long this lasts is like it yes it, it depends on the price of ease and and it changes every day so why doesn't the Ethereum Foundation like publish, I don't know, like every quarter is like, okay, these are the assets we have. Here's how we spent the money. These are like, there's very, there's feels like there's a lack of kind of a lack of communication and transparency in the foundation. Do you see that the same way or? So just, uh, just 
objectively, like, uh, when also, like, Ethereum is, as you know, like a Swiss foundation, and the EF has to do everything that is required by the Swiss laws because we are a Swiss foundation. And so it's doing everything that it's, it's required. Regarding financial statement, as a foundation, when there's obligation to disclose financial, this is, you know, just my knowledge is um, that you, you are required when you have actual like source of income from other organizations, meaning normal foundations have received grants from other organizations or governments. And that's where you you have uh, responsibility. Uh, I mean, I don't think anyone doubts that the Ethereum Foundation is complying with all of the you know foundation regulations and stuff. Yeah. I'm sure you are, but uh, but it still seems that maybe there's besides the legal issues, there's sort of from the Ethereum community, yeah, exactly, like a reasonable expectation that there would be like a transparent sharing of information. Yeah, so that's why that's why we are trying to. Um, you know, share, like you said, right, right? It's not legality, like it's about, you know, like for the community to feel uh, good about <laughs> the entire ecosystem. But again, like if community sees the Ethereum Foundation to be, I see the EDF, uh, you know, it's one of these holder, but, uh, but again, like since the, it does have a unique position, so we, we try to give uh more information that's really coming very soon so that's like a right now you are we are having this conversation we are about to make i'm pretty sure when this podcast is out there i don't know when it's going to this going to be out uh yes that's uh that's happening now that's that's good to hear that you're working on transparency. Um, so may I just come back to the runway question again? So basically, if you look at the 650k ETH that the foundation holds, and uh, if if we assume that that's the main uh, money that the foundation actually has, so it doesn't have enormous amounts in fiat, that's 130 million um, today. So if you give up 30 million in grants, and that's your main expense, um, that's a runway of four years. At, at today's um, Ether prices. So do you expect that Ether prices go up or do you expect that development is done in a uh, very few, in a very, a very few number of years? So we do have some fiat amount. Uh, if you wanna, there's some information out there. Again, like we are going to uh, be, give more information soon, but we do have some fiat amount, of course. That, so the year that you should just mention, but at the same time, again, uh, one of the things we try to do here is we don't think that the only EF providing or supporting the entire ecosystem is not sustainable. And one, it's not sustainable, but it's also not good for that. This is supposed to be decentralized, right? So that's why there are other funding mechanisms uh, now exist, which we are uh, we are excited to for for them to exist, but also at the same time we are happy to work together with them. That's why we are talking about more collaborations there. So hopefully, and then there are other you know like efforts for studying um, like DAO funding or all that. Um, so we are optimistic that there will be more other funding systems to exist um, in in the near future. And then there are that already exist like compared to before. And that's so, that's the beauty yeah. of making this more decentralized. Yeah, totally. I mean we'd love to come back to that in a second. But I'm I'm just curious. So you mentioned the Ethereum Foundation has a bunch of ETH and it has a bunch of fiat. Like, are there other like investments Ethereum Foundation has made, like either into you know equity of companies or potentially in different tokens? And like, if so, like, uh, you know, what are they? And, and how do you go about managing conflicts of interest? A foundation in non nonprofit can totally legally, again, like going back to invest, uh, but we don't invest. <laughs> um, that That's not the decision, uh, at least so far, that Ethereum Foundation has never made the decision to invest in other things or 
it could invest in the Ethereum project, but uh, we uh, we are not doing that now. So uh, that's the question sometimes I get asked, but we don't invest in things other than we do hold ETH, Ether. How do you deal with other potential conflicts of interest? So what kind of comes to mind, for example, is um, uh, Vitalik's angel investment into Starkware and Starkware then receiving a four million grant from the foundation. Do you have processes in place to make sure that everything is above board? Yeah, the process is basically, I think uh, um, it is not never start with whoever is involved in uh, investment and then we should support that like it always start from like you know um bottom up what are the most important and then someone applies for a grant and then is this really important for the ecosystem and so you know like we had no doubt that what starkware was working on was important and they have great team and uh that uh, our whole team uh, discussed with them, and then uh, we were confident that they would make good progress. And there are milestones that set place, so that the, that entire money has been provided yet, of course. And then they, they report to us every uh, every quarter. Um, so it is like one thing; it's already creating good impact. But also uh, about Starkware's, I, I don't know how. He was actually involved in, in the, the, but it, it, it is public information that he already made it clear uh, before this this grant happened. And yeah, that's the only detail, like, you know. But yeah, again, like we, of course, we, we watched because, you know, this was public information. And then of course, we watched that. If that could happen, we will definitely. Um, watch and discuss. You talked about um, DAO mechanisms of funding earlier. Um, and at Ethereum, you made the announcement that the Ethereum Foundation is actually going to uh, invest into um, the Monarch DAO. Can you talk about um, the rationale behind that and what your hopes for um, DAO funding mechanisms are for the future? We just made an announcement uh, at Ethereum in that the Ethereum Foundation is supporting um, Mark Dow with with one thousand ETH, and along with Vitalik himself as as individual, and Consensus and uh, Joe Levin as individual that that was announced at Ethereum. Uh, but then there are other individuals who are part of has have been part of Mark Dow already, and. I do think this is very good experience. Well, not just I, but the EF. Uh, we we thought we we're always open to experiment with using this technology, but then you can't really put a lot of money into like a, you know like something dangerous. But this is this is something that we thought it's a uh, with a good team, and then it's something DAO funding is something that the different way the ecosystem should experiment and so we are happy to support those efforts and uh starting with with smaller amount and that's not just for Moloch DAO, but this was the first thing we did uh and we are we will be excited to see more if if there will be something that will work and yeah so i'm excited to see this coming and then how this would work and then it's an exciting thing to see in the ecosystem. So historically, the Ethereum community has been this like kind of super open-minded place and like very tolerant of like all kinds of opinions. At least that's my my personal impression. It seems though that like in the last, I don't know, year or I'm not, not sure exactly sort of the time frame, but like it, it's kind of been changing and there's a lot for a bunch of things, right? So I think one, this is, if Ethereum maximalism has kind of come up with, you know, a lot of people being very adamant that Ethereum is, is the one and only a little bit like, you know, people have done it often in Bitcoin and it's become much more like hostile to, or, or like contentious and argumentative. Like, do you also see those changes? And like, what do you think is a driving factor here? 
I personally blame Twitter. <laughs> 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 I know I think it's the modern world, and not just about Ethereum or crypto. I think it's a, a kind of the challenge this this modern society has. Uh, it's a free free debate space, and then used to be like there is like a professionals of media who post things, and then they you actually check resources, uh, check the source of information, and then. So it's really hard to see what information is correct. And even this concept of the oh, Ethereum is getting becoming more maximalism. It's it's when one person started to say, you know, like other people could be manipulated. Um, but I still see that the whole Ethereum ecosystem to be very, very like open and peaceful. I mean, like the first of all, when I decided to support Ethereum. Um, not other other like uh, blockchains or other crypto effort is really about the culture. Um, like to me, technology is something you can copy. Anyone can copy. But the reason why they attracted so many people, uh, the e- Ethereum didn't really do a lot of like a mar- money marketing, <laughs> or it just didn't. It it naturally attracted so many people is so, really so what really is culture. what I is special culture. about ethereum's culture so like you said like i mean you you probably know better than like what like how it's just a this is very open but also we don't to me it's ethereum is really about i use the term kaizen at devcon but like improving something that exists and as long as so the, the vision, long-term vision is like, we want to create this platform, finish creating this platform so that the apps can you create the world of but the more distributed world, the power distributed, um, power decentralized world so that, uh, that we can solve problems like financial inclusions. Um, and, and that's the vision we want to see because we see a lot of problems because of this, because of centralized structure of this modern society. And, and that vision naturally attracted people like, oh, I want to be part of the com- this community because people care about this. And, and then I don't think that has changed, but if you only focused on some arguments on social media, it does, you know, like kind of, Spotlight those those problems, but I don't. I still don't think Ethereum is, has a lot of maximalists. But you know, sometimes people have, have have passion about what they work on, so they they might feel very protective about what they're working on. But that doesn't mean like Ethereum has become maximalist. I I don't don't think so. Yeah, and then I personally like again like when I said we need to support experiments is this whole crypto thing is this whole thing is, is experiment, right? And, and that's why it's so hard to work with regulators or because, you know, they, they're scared of risks. And, but for, for experiments to be, be experimented, we have to have different efforts. We can't just have one effort when it's, still an experiment so that's why we are very in, you know open to different ideas so so many blockchains are actually seen as um, competitors to ethereum how do you feel about that and how do you think ethereum should deal with um, competition yeah so the competition exists i don't i don't want to sound like like too naive that I don't see any competitions like the competition does exist in, in, you know, in different definitions, but we, as the Ethereum foundation, or I think the Ethereum culture in general, it doesn't really like it's, we're not really working on this to win. And so that's the competition is really like, there are other efforts that exist for, for us to like, it can actually help us to be better that already happens before too so again like i think like it, vitalik created ethereum when he thought about the better way to use blockchain 
than Bitcoin. And and then like because of Bitcoin, he was able to get Ethereum. Like without that, Ethereum hasn't been born. So it's not, you know, like that. That's that's not competition. It's more like a like this. This is. Uh, one idea that can inspire other ideas. So any other ideas can be in, in, inspiration for us to be better. And but again, it's not about winning. And that we think other other things out there could could inspire us. Uh, and that's that's the fundamental philosophy here. And I think that's the fundamental philosophy that Ethereum community also believes. But in, in the end, right, you have all of these different applications and there you have all of these different platforms and they're all trying to get the applications to build on them. So it is competitive, right? Because if the applications go elsewhere, then a project is not going to win or not going to succeed. For the application side, when you're a business, like you have you, your own priorities right and it's their decision to you know to decide which which blockchain makes most sense for them but there are things that like they're pri like for ethereum decentralization is the priority right like we don't compromise there that's why um the, there's scaling issues that the, the the whole ecosystem has been working on if we don't care about decentralization and then your decision would be something else. But that's okay because that's their decision. And when it's, you can define that as competition. But when you when your priority is something else, like we don't see it as a competition. Like yeah, yeah. Then then you decide on something else, and then there's no point for us to like you know convince them. No, you should. Because like uh, you care about different things in the world, we care about decentralization, and maybe some people don't. But I think it's naturally attracted so many people because so many people care about decentralizations. So, what are your hopes for Ethereum um, for the end of the year, and maybe for the next five years? So, my, I mean, like yes, like the entire ecosystem, and also yeah, uh, the end of the year, this. Uh, Serenity East 2.0 will show more more progress, but but also we see you know a lot of the apps applications are making huge progress already, and again that DevCom we often have this you know announcements and updates from them that's always exciting. So and that's uh, DevCom uh, by the way DevCom. Five this year is happening in Osaka in Japan uh, in, uh, in October. We hope to see those exciting, more exciting announcements, new applications happening. And then I personally hope to see more uh, usability in Ethereum, like both for developer experience, but also for the apps usability for, for end users. And and in the long run, again, like my original passion into this was really for this technology blockchain to be used for social impact or like a financial inclusion. Like, it, like I'd like to see that more. It's actually already happening, which is exciting. Uh, but I'd like to see that more in in the long run. And then uh, with that, we are doing this survey of the apps uh, solving real world issues. We started to do that at the end of last year and we are receiving like hundreds of submissions now which show that how many the apps are actually solving like real stuff like compared to five years ago, you know, long time ago, it was only those applications who, you know, say said they were using blockchains, but you know, not necessarily you didn't really see uh, the solution happening, but now we see that. I'm excited about that now, but I'm excited about the future that we'll, the world will have more of those. And then again, going back to my original passion, 
is something I'm excited about. Yeah, well, thanks so much for coming on, Aya. And just regarding DEF CON 5, so that's going to be in Japan. And of course, we'll put the, put the links in the Yeah, in I'm the actually wearing note. Ethereum Japan t-shirt <laughs> <Very good. laughs> for, for people in Japan. And just what, what are the, can you uh, remind us of the dates? Oh, yes. October 8th to 11th in, okay, in Osaka, okay. Japan. And more information will come very soon. And I'm like, of course, I'm from there. So I'm very excited about that. And then Osaka is very, like, more unique, has more characters. And so that's perfect for Ethereum. And, and I, you know. You know, I'm pretty sure a lot of people haven't been there, so I'm excited to see our community people there. Okay, well, thanks so much, Aya. It was a pleasure having you on, and uh, and yeah, learning about the Ethereum Foundation. Thank you so Thank much. You. Bye. We release new episodes of Epicenter every week. Click here to subscribe for hundreds of insightful interviews with some of the leading minds in blockchain and crypto. You can also listen to the audio version of the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, and other podcast apps. Click here for a full list of places where you can listen. Thanks for watching Epicenter, and we hope you'll join us for our next episode.